Hi everybody, sorry for the delay. I need to set up the camera. Okay. So, at this point, are you finishing uh, some? Oops, sorry. Oh no. Apparently there's some sensor here. I cannot close the door. At this point, is everybody finishing up assignment zero? How many of you have finished assignment zero? Kind of good. That's, that's more than I expected. <laughs> yeah, so basically this year is how we have one book deadline for both assignment one, zero and one, which will be next Friday. So at this point, you should be already familiar with the environment, how to compile the kernel, how to run the simulator, and also, you should, you should have a pretty good idea of assignment zero and ready to wrap up and move on to assignment one, right? Because assignment zero is kind of really just warm you up to give you some idea of what the, what the environment lo looks like and how to play with the kernel code. And assignment one is the, uh, the first assignment that you, sh you should really, uh, you are supposed to write some code. So, as Jeff posted on the Piazza today, I'm gonna to, I'm, I'm will not talk about the environment setup for some zero, which I assume you already know how to do that. And today we mostly cover the basics for assignment one, which is the synchronization primitives. So where are you guys on the lecture? Are you talking about the processes? Are you uh, talking about the synchronization primitives? So do you know what locks and sample phones are? Yes, that's good. <laughs> okay, so today we'll touch some bas basics for sample one and uh, show you how, to, how the OS 161 already provide some code for you to work on. Uh, my name is Jing Hao, and I will teach recitations this semester. So first, some logistics. Uh, the recitation is today at 4, this room, and Friday at 8, 8 a.m. So you, just, you, you can attend either one that suits your schedule. You don't have to attend the one you registered on the hub. So it's, off, it's also open to a uh, graduate student. So but the priority is given to undergrads who have already registered the course. And today we'll talk about assembly one and concepts and all that. I already talked about that. So the deadline for assembly zero and one is next Friday. So at this point, if you are still doing the assembly zero stuff, you really want to wrap up and move on to assembly one. Because the initial time allocation for you guys is one week for some zero and two weeks for some one. This is already the second week. Um, so assign, in assignment one, you will, be, uh, you will need to understand various kind of synchronization primitives, include, including lock, semaphore, which we will talk about today, and also condition variables and read write lock, which we will talk about in next week's recitation. And also, you need to solve two synchronization problems, the intersection problem and a well mating problem, which we'll also talk about next week. Um, so to do assignment one, the one uh, basic concept you need to understand is what is a critical section. Basically, the critical section is one piece of code, maybe, uh, several lines of code, that both the, uh, serves this both, uh, these both conditions. One is that this piece of code access the shared resource. If there is no shared resource, then we, do, we don't need to do synchronization at all, right? A second uh, condition is that this uh, shared resource cannot be accessed at the same time, right? You have to enforce orders. Someone need to access the resource first, and then someone access the latter. So one typical or classical example of this critical section, you can imagine that here in, is the shared printer case. 
where the shared resource here is a printer. And you have multiple users or computers who want to use this shared resource and do the, do the printing job. So in this example, our goal here is to design a self print uh, routine or method or function so that multiple users can safely share this printer, right? So a um, strawman approach or a naive approach would be like this. I do nothing, I just uh, in the self print uh, function, I just do the print. I don't care about the synchronization at all. So the, of course it doesn't work, why? Yeah. Yeah, that is not any checks. So what if I'm, I was printing, I have 10 pages, and then some, some other guy comes in, he also wants to print. I have to prevent him from printing, right? Otherwise, our print job will, will be mixed up. So this is why we introduced the concept of lock. Basically, the lock is designed to enforce a mutual exclusion concurrency control, meaning that once I acquire the lock, somebody else has to wait before I finish. Right? So the interface of the log is pretty simple. Basically two main interfaces. One is acquire the log. Basically I want to acquire the resource. And then, so which is indicating I'm about to enter the critical section. So what will happen when I call log acquire? What are the possibilities there? Well, in the most ideal case, nobody is using it, right? When I call lock acquire, I get the lock immediately, right? That's the most ideal case. What if somebody else has already hold the lock? Somebody else called lock acquire before you, right? Yeah, you either you, yeah, you have to wait. Otherwise, yeah, because there's only one lock available, right? Depending on how you are gonna wait, there are two kinds of locks. Either you keep querying if the lock is available, is, which is called busy waiting, where you just keep querying if the lock is available. Another way is, so you are call a lock acquire. Inside lock acquire, you know the lock is not available. Then instead of keep waiting there, you just sleep, right? And expecting the previous holder to wake you up when the previous holder is done with the lock, right? So Jeff will talk about all this kind of differences in the lecture. So you need, all you need to do, so at this point, all you need to do is there's two kinds of locks. One is the spin lock, where you keep waiting on the lock. Another is called sleep lock, or normal lock, where you sleep if the lock is, is not available. And the setting interface is pretty straightforward, lock release, you're done with the lock, or you're done with the critical section. You just release the resource so somebody else can use the, use the lock, or uh, use the resource. So here's the second version of the self print. Instead of just to do the print in the, in the inside the function, I first lock, acquire the lock. So if I reach line three, the third line here, I know that I'm the only person that are using this resource. In this case, it's a printer. And I also know that any further users will be blocked in line two, right? So before I release the lock, I'm the only holder of this lock. Anyone who wants to use the printer has to wait, right, in, in line two case. In, uh, wait in line two, the acquire function. So once I'm done, I release the lock, I'm done with the print job. Somebody else can continue with the printer. Any questions so far? Okay, it's kind of pretty straightforward, right? So. The OS161 has already provided a spin lock for you. Like, like I explained, this version lock doesn't do any smart thing. It just keep banging the lock until the lock is available. Then it continues, right? It's defining the header file, that's spinlock.h, and implemented in the spinlock.c. This one has already implemented for you. You don't have to, you just need to understand how this spin lock works. And uh, you don't have to write any code for this. So let's take a look at the actual code. I'm gonna first exit.
is a terminal so go to source code directory and go to kernel include uh, spin log Where, where is the header file again? No, it's not there. Oh, yeah, right. Thanks. OK, here we go. So actually, at this point, I mean, before Jeff explains the difference between the spin log and the spin sleep log, all you need to do is understand the interface of the spin log. Basically, as we have explained, there are two major interfaces. One is Spinlock Acquire, which allows you to acquire the resource. And after you are done with the resource, there is a Spinlock Release function. So these two are the most important one. At this point, you, need, you just need to understand the semantics of these two interfaces. Right? You don't have to go to the details of how the Spinlock works. Then, besides these two, there are some helper functions let, which uh, initialize the Spinlock for you here and clean up the spin log and also check there is a one function allows you to check if you hold the spin log so the spin log part is quite simple mostly because you don't have to understand how it works right? you just need to understand the semantics now the okay so this we have already dealt with one printer example right what if you have multiple printers? In that case, how do you coordinate the access to the printers? Right? Will this version 2 still work? How many no? Why? Why it doesn't work? Not necessary. I mean, it would work in the sense that we. Mm -hmm. Well, you have multiple printers. If you use a one giant lock to protect all the printers, what will happen? I mean, one user acquires the lock, he acquires all the printers, right? In fact, he, does, he only needs one printer. But this will work in the sense that it will pro pro provide the correct output, meaning that no printing jobs will be messed up, right? But it's not the best in the sense that you are wasting the resources. You have multiple printers. Why only allow one user to use all the resources at, a, at the one time, right? You should be able to allow different users, as long as there are printers left, you should be able to allow the users keep using it until all, all the printers are occupied, right? So he, well, that's why we introduced the concept of semaphore, which it is supposed to manage a set of resources instead of just one, right? And it allows up to a certain number of threads in a critical section. In the printer case, Suppose we have five printers, we will allow up to five users using the printers, and that's it. Right? If you really think about it, actually the lock is a special case for semaphore, where the resource number is one. Right? If the semaphore number is one, then there's no difference between lock and, sem and semaphore. They are both achieve the same effect. And the interface of semaphore is just like log, it's quite simple. We have P and V. These names are maybe peculiar at the first glance. You may, you, if you are curious, you can check Wikipedia to see why it's P and V. But let's assume it's no more English word. P is means you want to decrease or you want to acquire a resource. So you would P the printer semaphore to acquire one resource, and then you do the printing job. So you know that um, not more than this number of, of users will be in the critical section. So once you finish the P or acquire, you know there will always be one print, at least one printer available for you. Right? And similarly to lock release, we have V, which is to release one resource. So P is basically acquire one resource, and V is to release one resource. And also similar to lock acquire, when you do P, there is a possibility that you need to wait before the previous users release the resource, right? So, so 
as Spinlock sample phone is also provided to you. And it's very important to understand how sample phone works for you to correctly implement another version of the lock, CV and, and the read-write lock. So let's go over in the details of how sample phone works. Here. As I said, sample phone is defined in kernel includes sync dot edge. And if you look at the interfaces, so here's the definition of sample phone. So everybody know the, what the structure is in C, right? How many of you don't, don't know the structure keyword? Okay, so if you want to see that it's, it's the best, structure is just structure. If you don't know C, you can imagine structure as a class without, a mem without methods. It's just a member fields in, in Java or any other object-oriented language. So here we have a string, basically character pointer, called the name, which doesn't play any actual role, but just to, for humans to know the semaphone well. And we have a wet channel, basically a queue where the threads can slip on if there is no resource left. And we have, uh, interestingly, we have a spin lock inside the semaphone. So you can see, as you can see that spin lock is actually a building block for any other more complicated uh, primitives, right? The same rule applies when you try to implement the normal log or the condition variables. So you, are, you, start, you should start noticing the building blocks for these synchronization primitives. One is the slipping channel or wet channel where you can put a thread to wet for something. And another is a spin lock. And finally, we have a semaphone count, which represents how many resources are avail available that this semaphone manages, right? So this is the structure. And we have helper functions for you to create a semaphone or initialize it, and then also destroy it. So here we have two interfaces, P, well, this is a word, initial for a word. And the decrement of the count and basically acquire the resource and a V. <coughs> so any questions before yeah? Not a collection. We we don't we don't have one spin lock. Right? We have a count. Right? Suppose we have five resources to make to manage, how many spin locks do we have? One. How? Uh, so initially, what's the count value? That's a good question. Suppose there are five resources. What what do we do in the uh, semaphone create? Basically, when we initialize the semaphone, what's the initial value for count? Five, right? Initially, it should be five. When I do p, so the basic idea is when I do p, I decrease it, right? I d keep decreasing until it reaches zero. At which point, I will have to wait, right? When I do V, what do I do? I increase the count, right? Basically indicating that uh, one more resource is, is available. Okay. So that's the basic idea of P and V. Sounds very simple, right? When I P, I minus, minus. When I do V, I plus, plus, right? But as you may find out, it's not that simple. There are some corner cases you need to consider. So let's go to the implementations of uh, semaphore and see what the corner case is. So here, first the create basically initialize the semaphore. So, so what are arguments or parameters this function takes? What is this semaphore called? The name. And what's the initial count? Inici initial count is basically how many resources that this semaphore are supposed to manage, right? So we just assert initial count should be positive, or although initial count zero does, doesn't mean anything, right? And what's that? Exactly, but that's more advanced topics for sample phone. Yeah, you can initialize as zero, and later on you can v it. Yeah. So 
here we allocate the space for summer phone and we set the name, set the web channel, initialize the spin log, initialize the summer phone count, and we're done. So you, you need to get used to the style of in C, how do you acquire resources? How do you allocate the memory? Um, we have a destroy first, so we just release every resources we just acquired for each uh, memory we can allow, we need to care free and all that. So this, those are not minor details. So this is the interesting part. In P, we need to, basically we want to decrement the count, right? Uh, for now, just ignore this part. The first thing we do is actually acquire the spin lock. Why is that? Access what? Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's more or less that's right in the sense that so in this case, in as as long as as far as the semaphone concerns, what's the shared resource? It, what, does the semaphone care what resources do you use between P and V? It doesn't know, right? It doesn't care about that. So, as far as the semaphone concerns, what's the shared resource? What's that? Semaphone what? It's self. Well, it's, mo it's more general. I want specifics. What's the shared resource in the case? P function. No, that's not function. What, yeah, what, what I want is uh, a resource to the semaphone. So what's the resource? Function is not a resource. You can always call a function. No. What's that? I heard something. Yeah. Yeah, same count. So everybody tries to decrement the count. I need to protect that op operation, right? Otherwise, how do I coordinate between the various uh, users or threads, right? Here, so as far as the semaphore concerns, the shared resource is only one int, the count, right? As long as the pr I protect the count correctly, I can always ensure the correct behavior. So here, we you so another question is what's the spin lock are supposed to protect? The count, right? So now you understand why we have a spin lock inside the semaphone because the spin lock are supposed to protect the access to the count, right? So because we want to check the count, which is access or read the count, we need to protect the access using the lock. So we acquire the spin lock, and after this acquire, I know that I'm the only person now looking at the count, right? And others will be prevented by the spin lock acquire. So I'm a, now I'm the only person inside of this section, so I check the semaphone count. If it's zero, it's a trick to, so this here we do while it's zero, or you can do if it's zero, but it doesn't matter. So suppose I'm the first, first person coming to the critical section. What's the semaphone count? It should be positive, right? Like five. So let's say it's five. So we will not enter this while. And it's, so we reach here. So after this while loop, I know the semaphone count is positive. So it's safe for me to decrement the count. This is the only operation I really want to do. But in order to do that, I need to acquire the spin log and check it first. Okay, then I release the spin. I'm done. I'm the lucky person. I'm the first one. I just I'll grab the log, grab the resource, and I go. Right. So that's the first. I'm the first user. Now the second user comes. The same thing happens. Um, is the second user acquire the spin log? The sum of count is four now, and meaning that there are still four resources available, and I decrement the count and continue, and so on. Right. So suppose all the five resources, suppose five user has called P without calling any V. Now what's the value of the count? So at, in the, after the fifth thread or user called this uh, P function, this should be one, right? There is only one resource left. And I decrement it. 
Now it's zero, but I don't care. I already grabbed one. So I continue. Now the sixth one comes. What happens? I, I can acquire a spin log, no problem, because nobody is using spin log. But the semiconductor exists because it's zero, right? Which means there is no resource left. I need to wait. So now you get an idea of why we use a while instead of an if. Because you may need to check the uh, resource multiple times. So the, in the most simple example, I'm the sixth user. And nobody else is trying to call P. I'm fine. And I wait here. So I uh, lock the web channel, uh, release a spin lock, because I don't need to care about a spin lock anymore. And here's the question. Why do I need to release a spin lock? What if I go to sleep without a release the spin lock? What, what will happen? What's that? Well, I really don't care about the seventh one, right? As long as some somebody before me released a lock, I can continue release. Sorry, release a semaphore or increment the count. I can continue, right? So why do I release the lock? Give up some lock? Yeah. I'm guessing the release function has also acquired. Yes, exactly. So in order for the previous guys to release the lock, they needed to acquire the lock, the sorry, release some resource by incrementing the count, right? They needed to acquire the spin lock. If I go to sleep while holding the lock, then how are, I supposed to, how are those guys supposed to increment the, increment the count? So we're, they will get stuck, right? So in order for them to increment the count, I have to give up the spin lock, and then I'll go to sleep, right? And when I wake up, the first thing I do is I reacquire the spin lock. Why that's the case? Why do I need to? I, I'm already here. Why do, do I need to acquire the spin lock? What's that? Yeah, you are. So one rule of thumb is that whenever you access a shared resource, in this case the same account, you always need to protect it by the lock, either a spin lock or later on in some other lock you implement it, right? Another um, another way to interpret it is this is that suppose I'm not the only one waiting for this lock. While I was sleeping, the seventh guy coming also go through the process and also wait on this semaphore. And when the say the first guy done with the semaphore and the incremental count, we both get to wake up. Then we need to compete for the spin lock to ensure that only one of them can go, go back to the while loop and check the count, right? So suppose there are two guys, the sixth and the seventh guy are waiting for the semaphore, and then both get waked up here, but I'm lucky, so I acquire the spin lock. I go back, check the count, which should be one by now, right? I only got wake up because somebody else wake me up. And somebody else should have already increment the count already, right? So semiconductor is one, so it's good. I jump out of the while loop and, I, and uh, decrement the count, indicating, hey, I'm now holding a one resource now. And I'm done with this P function. I just release and continue. And that unlucky guy will get stuck here. So after I after the first guy released the spin lock, the second the second guy can, can acquire the spin lock now. But at this point, the semiconductor is zero already because I already um, decrement the count. So unfortunately, he has to sleep again, uh, waiting for some other guy to wake him up. So that's how the acquire process works. Let me just quickly go through the release process before we can discuss this, right? It will be much simpler. So the V is actually kind of simpler than acquire, than P, right? You first acquire spin lock, one rule of thumb, whenever you access the shared resource, you always grab the, grab the lock, right? Then you uh, wake up somebody, so you first increment the count, indicating, indicating you are done with the resource, now there's one more resource available, 
and then you wake up some guy in the web channel. This is why we need the web channel, right? We need somewhere where the further acquirers have a place to wait and uh, the releasers of the previous releasers know where to wake up those guys. So we wake up somebody. I don't really care who to wake up, just wake up with them or or wake up one or wake them all. It's the same. And I release a spin up and down, I'm done with this V. Right? So now go back to look at the P and um, V again. Are there any questions about this? So everybody understand how P and V works, how you can use spin lock, and how you can use the web channel. Right? You, you, you need a spin lock because, because you have some shared resource you want to protect. You use the web channel because when that resource is not available, you want to have a place where the threads can sleep on. Right? So this is how semaphore works. And it's very important for you to understand how it works before you can continue and implement other primitives. Right? So any questions? What's that? Which we don't care. I don't know. I mean, as long as someone someone is holding the log, I cannot con holding some resource. I cannot continue. I really don't know who is holding it. There is no way for me to find out. So now, do you have any idea how to implement the log? I mean, the normal log. So as I explained in the spin log case, when you acquire a spin log but the lock is already held by somebody else, what do you do? You, you keep while loop on that spin lock, right? Basically, the CPU is busy. Now, the assignment one requires you to implement a different version of the lock where you find, when you find that the lock is not available, instead of you keep banging the spin lock, you go to sleep on a web channel, right? How, how are you gonna, supposed to implement that? Do you have any ideas now? Yeah. And basically you can just make the second call with counter one. That's one way. That's that's cheating actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it will it will work and I don't know if we can detect that. I think we can. Well in in some private uh, conversations I have recommended people to use it. But as of now, I will still recommend to implement the whole process. Instead of just using semaphore with initial count of one, you go over the process and implement the logic yourself. That way it will, it will, it will help you understand how this semaphore works. Right. So in the case of lock, I mean, or there's one difference though. Lock has a holder. Semaphore doesn't have a holder. There's one um, interface that log has, but semaphore doesn't. Oh, yeah. What is that? Log do I hold? If you just use semaphore with initial kind of one, you can implement the semantics of acquire and release, no problem, right? But how do you answer log do I hold? That's one question to consider if you want to go over the easy parts, right? So let's see what's already there in logs. So basically nothing. We have a name, which does nothing, and add whatever you need. So by, by now, you should have a pretty good idea what you need. What do you need? Spin log. So you need to protect something, right? What else? What does semaphore has? Waiting channel. Waiting channel. So what, where people would wait if the resource is not available. You said count. Mm -hmm. In this case, I don't really care about the count because count will be always one and zero, one, zero or one. So you can have a boolean. Yeah, that's basically can implement what semaphore can provide, a semaphore with initial count of one, right? But how do you answer lock, lock do I hold? What else do you need to keep in the log structure? 
some kind of identifier, right? So whoever acquired the log should put his identifier in the structure. So later on, when I call log do I hold, I can compare compare my ID with the ID in the log um, structure, right? If they're the same, then I know I'm the holder of the log. Otherwise, I'm not the holder of the log. Some kind of ID, right? You need to figure out what kind of ID. You said PID. Well, at this point, there is no concept of PID yet in this OS, in OS 1.6.1. You are about to implement it in Assembly 2. So what else can you use? Again, we don't have thread ID. Yeah. There's some other things you can use to unique, uniquely identify a thread. I will leave you to figure that out. That's kind of the, the most difficult question in some one. After that, you, you'll be fine. So we need a spin lock. We need a, a web channel. We need a kind of a count. Right? Or Boolean to indicate if the is lock is held by somebody else or not. And we also need an ID, some sort of ID to indicate the holder of the lock. Right? That's the information we need for lock. And let's go back to the C code where, okay, so you have this many stuff in the lock structure, then you should initialize them in the lock create. Right, you can initialize the spin lock. You will need to in initialize the web channel, initialize the status of the lock as unheld or available, or the ID, and the ID. Oops. Okay. So in lock acquire, what do we do? So go think about a semaphore. What does a semaphore does as the first thing, besides a kind of characters? What it does in the first step? What's that? Don't remember? Oh, quite a spin lock, right? Because so conceptually, what do you want to do in lock acquire? Check the status of the lock, right? If nobody is holding it, I'm, I'm going to grab it. If uh, or somebody is already have the lock, I need to go to sleep. That's the two things you need to do in the lock acquire, right? So what, whichever you do, you need, the first thing you want to do is acquire a spin lock because you are accessing some shared resource. In the case of a lock, what's the shared resource? The status of the lock, right? Either acquired or not. And then after acquire the lock, what do you do? Again, similar to semaphore, you can actually copy paste the most of the code of semaphore to lock. It's OK. Just you need, you need to understand what it does. So you check the status. If it's available, just to be optimistic and say it's available, I set it to unavailable, right? And I release the lock. I'm done. I'm the first person ever tried to acquire this lock. Now, what 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 about the second second person? Acquire the spin lock, check the status. Oh, I missed one thing in the first uh, person case. What do I miss? I acquire the lock. It's available. I set it to unavailable. I release. Is that everything? Do I miss something? Ownership. Ownership, right? I need to indicate that I own the lock. No, not just the, the lock is owned by somebody, but it's me, right? So I acquire the spin lock, check the status, it's available. I set it to unavailable. I set the owner to me, and I release the spin lock. I'm done. I'm the, if that's the case for the first person. Now in the second case, second person case, acquire the spin lock, check the status, not available. I sleep on the web channel. But before that, yeah. Why do you have to have the ownership? ownership. Yeah, because some, so we are trying to implement some functions for others to use. 
it's handy to have a lock do I hold. So suppose I, want, I just want to poke the system. I don't want to work there. So I can call lock do I hold to check. Uh, oh, sorry, that's not the case. The case is sometimes you have nested locks, which uh, in, in uh, uh, example would be in function A, you acquire a lock, right? Then you call function B. Inside the, func inside the function B, function B may be read by some other third party library. And he will also want to acquire the lock. So it's handy for function B to have a, um, a, a piece of code saying, if I already hold the lock, I don't need to acquire the lock again. So it's, we are writing some primitives for others to use. It's, um, and it's best for us to provide the full functionality to check the ownership of the lock, right? So if inside of the nested function B, if I already hold the lock, then I don't need to acquire the lock again. It will be a waste, right? Yeah. Why don't we have this functionality in the semaphore? In the semaphore, how do you say this? Who owns the semaphore? Are you going to prove? We have a list of the people who actually. In that case, will the will the semaphore scale? I mean, if the resource initial count is one thousand, are you going to keep one thousand identifiers? Yeah, because semaphore doesn't have an ownership concept, but the lock does, right? So go back to the second person. Uh, who need to do the, all this? Lock the web channel, release the spin lock, sleep on this web channel, and when we wake up, acquire the spin lock again. And then the rest are quite similar to the first. So any questions on that? Does everybody know how to implement the lock? OK. So we have uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, I'm, I'm done with all the contents I need to. Yeah. 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 Inside a spin lock acquire, you will keep waiting there. So when you call spin lock acquire, inside this this is a function, right? The function is in, in, somewhere else. Inside that function, you will keep banging the lock, lock to see if it's available. After this function, you just continue ex execution, right? Then you sleep outside the spin lock. <laughs> as as far as spin lock concerns. It doesn't really know what you do besides acquire and release, right? So you can choose to sleep in, in between them. So I guess that's what I need to talk about today. OK, so this is what we talked about today. And we have 10 minutes left. I'll be here. If you have any questions you want to me to check, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks.